sponsored by Taylor Freelance, Rainier Ballistics, Hodgson Powders, and JPL Precision. Hey everybody, welcome to this week's episode of Power Factor. Uh, that I do something similar to what Doug has been doing here in the past of doing sort of like the uh, the backyard chat session here. So hope you enjoy that. A little different than the, uh, the the garage filming episodes that I've done before in the past. So hope your summer's been going well so far. Um, this week's episode is going to be on shooting slumps uh, or slumps that you can get into um, and also probably a discussion about plateaus and, and things of that nature. Um, so plateaus, plateaus are usually a, a peak in your performance where you get to a certain level and then for whatever reason you just can't seemingly break through that level. Um, when I was doing pistol shooting, I found that I had a similar situation happen when I hit B class. Um, I kind of stayed in B class for probably, I think about two years or so, and was never really going forward and never really going backwards. I think I've talked about this before in the past, but kind of what I found is is that in order to, to break out of, of that kind of state, I needed to change something with respect to my shooting technique. Um, and I've talked before about that pass and I won't reiterate on it all over again. You can go back and, and check about it or check it out in some of the previous episodes, but that's kind of the definition of a, of a shooting plateau. Um, and to be honest, in terms of shotgunning, I really haven't hit a, a point of a plateau yet. Um, primarily because my consistent, my, my shooting consistency hasn't been, been consistent enough, if you will, to, to actually hit one. Um, however, I, I have posted in just in using the, the NSCA tournament results as a, an example or a measure. Um, I posted quite a few 80, 82, 81s or so, so that might be defined as my my shooting plateau. Um, but today we're going to primarily talk about shooting slumps, and shooting slumps are typically kind of a, a long term. Uh, or consistent degradation in your performance. Now, when it comes to shooting, we're all going to have situations where we have off days, and, and that is not the definition definition of a shooting slump. When you have an off day or maybe a couple, you know, off days or whatever, um, th that's usually not a, a slump. And a slump is usually defined as a, a decrease in what you would define as your your normal performance. So before we get too far into this episode, I want to share with you kind of a. a an initial story here, which will actually kind of tie into this. Um, back in spring of this year, my wife and I went down to uh, to Phoenix and visited a friend and went down and for spring training Mariners um, baseball, uh, spring training there. And I decided to go over to the Ben Avery Shooting Sports Center uh, to shoot sporting clays. And uh, my wife uh, joined me, uh, went out, and the, this was kind of my first experience of using what's called the card system. And the card system, if you're not familiar with that, is that you, you each station has basically a, a card reader, and you put your card in a slot, and that card keeps track of, of how many birds have been thrown. So the way Ben Avery does it is that you, you pay for your card, which is given 100 credits or 100 birds, and you go out and shoot the course. Now, the first thing I noticed is that, um, from what I understand, a lot of other places do is that they'll, you know, when you when you sign up for or when you pay for a hundred or whatever, they give you like you know some number over that because they're trying to uh, accommodate for broken birds or whatever the case may be. So one thing I noticed is that with respect to Ben Avery, is that when you when you purchase a card for a hundred birds, that's all you got was a hundred birds. So often when it comes to shooting sporting clays, we have what's called a show pair or at least we do it at the club ranges that I've, that I've been to, even for practices. And a, a show pair is typically where you walk into the station, they throw, you know, the two birds so that you can see where the birds are coming from. It allows you to, you know, to obviously observe what they're doing, come up with your hold point, your break point, you know, your look point, so on and so forth. Um, they don't do that at Ben Avery. You literally walk into the station, and, and if you want to throw show pairs, those are countered against you. And I can understand that. That's okay. That's, you know, you know, not that big of a deal because otherwise people could go out there and it's like, I want to see another, I want to see another, I want to see another. Um, but what I did run into, which I felt was a bit of a problem, 
is that some of the stations were having problems in counting the number of birds that were being thrown. So as an example, I went into one station and it, it threw, the, the menu said that it was throwing, say, three true pairs, so two birds in the air. So I put my card in, hit the go button, or my wife hit the, pulled the, the, you know, was pulling for me, hit it, threw one bird, and I thought, okay, and where's the other one? And notice that it, it decremented two. And I thought, well, that's weird. I only saw one bird, so do it again. Throw it, one bird decrements two, and I thought, well, that's, you know, not right. And it didn't do this at every station, but it, it did it at a few of them. And then you'd throw, you know, you hit it again, and it would throw two, two birds. Um, and I thought, well, that's really weird. So you kind of ran into this problem of, am I going to see one turn, one bird or two birds? And then also on, on top of that, if you re don't really know what you're going to get. So to make a long story short, um, by the end of the course of fire, where it was supposed to be a hundred birds, uh, I had only seen, I think about 88 or so. I had 12 shot shells left over. And a shot actually, which I felt was pretty good, I shot about a 73, give or take, it was like 72, 73, 74, somewhere in there, out of, of 88 birds um, thrown. Uh, which, considering that I wasn't looking at, at any of the, um, of the troop hairs and I was shooting a gun that I was not familiar with, and, and what we did there is we were able to rent a, um, a shotgun there at the facility, which turned out to be a Breda A300 which, uh, interestingly enough, is the same shotgun that my wife shoots, so I was somewhat familiar with it, but I will say that the stock on a, on a standard A300 is considerably shorter than what I'm used to. So I felt good about my score um, and, and how I reacted to targets that I wasn't you know, able to see in advance, basically just shooting on instinct. I went back to the office and mentioned to them about um, you know, the, the fact that I was having trouble on stations. And their first response was, well, did you call us? And I thought, well, nobody have told me to call anybody, call anybody if I was running into problems. And furthermore, I don't know what number I would call if I did. So the guy asked, okay, well, what stations were you having trouble on? And I told him exactly which ones it was. And his response was, hmm, I thought we had those fixed, but I guess not. We'll have to send somebody out to look at that. And that was it. There was no offer whatsoever to, you know, well, here's, you know, 12 birds or 15 birds or whatever, go out and, you know, finish the shells that you have that you still have or whatever. It was just kind of like, well, sorry about that. And that was it. So I'm in a position here since I'm traveling um, that I have no need for, you know, 12 shotgun shells. I can't take them with me. So I just said, here, take them, you know, donate them to your junior program or whatever. So I, I really... After that experience at Ben Avery, I, to be honest, don't anticipate ever going back there again because I just didn't like their attitude and I didn't like the way they were running things. And again, I'm, I'm not a real big fan of the card system. However, I have heard that the places that use the card system will typically, like I said, give you, you know, some excess number of birds over accommodating for broken birds or trouble or whatever the case may be. Um, so I, I would just say that I was, you know, pretty disappointed in the whole entire experience um, altogether. You know, this sort of seems like, I guess, to put it in a similar situation is you go to the gas station and you say that you're going to go pump 10 gallons of gas and the thing reads 10 gallons of gas, but in reality you find out that you only got 9 gallons of gas and you go up to the counter and say, hey, I only got 9, and their response was, well, I thought we had that fixed, but I guess not. <laughs> you know, and it's like, okay, so you just got screwed. So where this ties into the whole entire discussion about shooting slumps is that when I, normally when I shoot, I shoot with a contact in my right eye. My right eye is not quite as strong as my left eye. So I, I typically or often will use a contact in my right eye to sharpen up the vision, vision or focus of my right eye. And I didn't do that when I went down to Ben Avery. And, and after shooting fairly well, I thought, well, that's interesting. Maybe I don't actually need to be using um, that contact. So when I came back to my home range at Granite Falls, I went out and, and shot um, and was having considerable difficulty, strangely enough, on, on targets that were going left or right. Um, either during sporting clays or I later found out also it seemed like on, um, on trap two. Like I went over to station five and trap and, and felt like I couldn't hit the broadside of a barn from the inside. I just was not shooting well. So I, I did that one week and then went out there and did the same thing, shot without a contact again and, and again did very poorly and thought, you know, this is really strange. I don't know what's going on. So, um, of course, you start getting frustrated and you start coming up with all sorts of excuses in your mind of, well, what could it be? So my first thought is, okay, well, it must be the contact. And the contact, the fact that I'm not wearing one must be what's causing all of this. 
So next time I went out, I tried putting the contact in and shot, and again, couldn't hit seemingly anything for some dumb reason going left to right. It's like right to left, I didn't have a problem, but left to right, I did. Um, and of course, this just causes you to get more and more frustrated and start, you know, analyzing things and trying to figure out what's going on. And this is literally the, the you know, what I was seeing here is the beginning of a, of a downward spiral or slump. And, and usually what happens in terms of slumps, what triggers them is that you start getting frustrated, um, you start questioning your own abilities, um, you start, you know, basically over, overworking or trying to look for too much. And that's one of the problems that we have in, in shotgunning is that when you run into a shooting problem, usually what you do is you start becoming even more and more attentive to focus or the position of the gun relative to the bird. And while I don't feel I was actually, you know, coming back and bead checking of looking back at the gun, um, I, I think what it got down to, I was probably overworking the bird or, or being a little bit too much aware of, of what was going on. So this unfortunately turned into a, a pretty severe spiral. I mean, my, my scores on a sporting clay course on practice went from usually on a 50 bird course um, in the, usually I could shoot around 40, 42, somewhere in there. I was down like about, you know, 29, uh, which was a, a pretty severe drop in, in my performance. And of course, you know, the worse it gets or the longer it gets, the more frustrating it gets. And, and it just turns into a, a negative spiral. And consequently, I started really analyzing um, everything that I was doing, uh, thinking, okay, well, I'm not stabilizing the bird enough. Um, I'm not looking hard enough. I am using the wrong hold point. I'm using the wrong look point. Um, you know, just, I mean, just pretty much everything, textbook, by the book, that you could think of in terms of mechanics I was looking at um, rather than probably what was really the true cause of all this. Um, Gil Ash, in his book, Sporting Clay's Consistency, uh, You Gotta Be Out of Your Mind, has a chapter on, on, um, on shooting plateaus and slumps. And, and his definition usually is that slumps can come in one of two forms either a mechanical issue or a mental issue. And mechanical issues are usually defined as, um, you know, you made a change in the gun, you've made a change in um, maybe your hold point or your look point or your setup or pre-mounting the gun versus low mounting the gun um, or, or just, you know, that sort of a thing. Mental issues usually come into, you know, the whole entire thought process, something that you're doing differently um, and unfortunately, I would probably say that if you're somewhat an accomplished shooter, the mechanical issues are probably not the cause of the problem because you've been, you know, you, you've got your gun mount down, assuming that you're not changing your gun or making any dramatic changes. Um, and, and let's say an example of sort of a mechanical issue might be that you switch from a one-eye shooter to a two-eye shooter. Well, when that happens, you're going to go backwards, and, and you can guarantee you're going to go backwards, and, and you understand that you're going to go backwards in a situation like that, and that will induce a shooting slump, but you know what the reason for that is. Um, so, like I said, if you're an accomplished shooter and you haven't made any dramatic changes, usually it's probably not going to fall into a mechanical issue. It's, it's typically always a mental issue, and, and that's what it turned out to be in my case. Um, it, it's interesting, and I, I hate to ad admit this, but because of the fact that I'm in engineering, or an engineer, um, that I, I ended up talking to a instructor, a level one instructor last week, who knows me fairly well, um, and kind of pointed out two things that I'm probably going to suffer from. One is being an engineer and analyzing everything. Um, when it comes to shooting, I always thought, well, there's got to be some system or method or technique or whatever the case is that I can latch on to here that will increase my chances of hitting birds. Um, and I would go through and think, okay, well, it's got to be, you know, I'll, I'll break this whole entire shooting process down to where I'll, I'll get, you know, a specific spot, or fairly, so to speak, where I'll hold the gun, and then a specific spot where I'll look, and then I'm gonna, you know, have a specific spot where I want to break it, and so on and so forth. And then when the bird's in the air, I'm gonna try to, you know, stabilize the picture and see the relationship of the, of the, the bird and the barrel but without looking at the barrel or anything like that to accomplish this. And I talked before about that before, um, in the past about the 95-5 the relationship that Gil Ash talks about where 95% of your awareness is on the bird and the other 5% or so is on, on the gun. 
Um, so I was trying to, you know, say, okay, well, I'm going to have awareness of the, of the bird, but also be aware of the gun's position relative to the bird without looking at it. And I started going through all of that, um, trying to really analyze and, and break down the shot. The other problem he mentioned uh, is that because of the fact that I have a long history of pistol shooting, that for years, especially at a, there's one of my cats, <laughs> at a competitive level, um, that 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 you that he he has found that pistol shooters and rifle shooters accomplished pistol shooters and rifle shooters especially ones that that have been shooting competitively will really um highly place place a high premium on accuracy um and and placing the shot now i'm not saying that this is coming down to aiming or anything like that but the problem is i think mentally is that i'm trying to be a little too cautious or or specific about where i have the gun relative to the bird and consequently what you end up doing is you're is you're kind of i'm going to use the term measuring the position of the gun relative to the bird without going back and bead checking um but you're you're very keenly aware of where the gun is relative to the bird because we're trying to be very accurate with with the placement of the shot one of the other problems that I, I, actually this was a positive in terms of pistol shooting, but I think it turns out to be a negative in terms of shotgun shooting, is that I learned um, in pistol shooting that I was able to look through the sights at the target, but also be very keenly aware of, of the sights in my line of vision. So I could look at the target, but I also was able to pick up on the sights at the same time, and I knew where they were on the target. And my brain has had that, basically that, you know, technique built into it. So I'm doing the same thing when it comes, I think, to comes to shotgun shooting is that I'm looking at the bird, but I know where the gun is because I've kind of built that into my, my shooting pattern of, of look at the target, but be aware of where the gun is. So that's going to be something um, that's going to be a challenge that I'm going to have to work through. But what this all gets down to in the end is that um, my friend said basically, you know, one thing you're going to have to learn here is that you you cannot overanalyze this, you cannot overwork the shot. You literally have to just rely on your instincts and turn it over to your subconscious to you know take care of the shooting problem for you, um, and and you know do this over and over and over uh, repeatedly. And it comes down to sort of the idea of banking, if you will. Um, shot pictures of, of what works and what doesn't so you know you'll go out and if you after enough time of experience you do the same thing over and over and over that image gets ingrained ingrained into your memory so that when you are put into that position you know roughly you know where the gun should be relative to the target you don't have to think about it so that's something that i'm gonna have to work on here um in you know in the coming months or whatever to to really trust um trust the instinct of shooting process and and um and and quit trying to overwork the birds and, and just go through this numerous times to, to get through it uh it's interesting in that last weekend or last week uh, i was out practicing with dave jeffrey uh who we've had in the program before dave's a master class shooter not an instructor but um, very good shot and we were shooting uh, crossers, um, crossers, pretty fast crossers at distance. And, and typically, most of all the shots that I'm accustomed to in terms of either practice or um, just the type of shooting we do is usually targets within, I'm going to say, 30 yards. Um, what I would find where I would have problems when we had the, the registered shoots where we'd try to throw or you would have something a little out of the ordinary at distance, then when it started getting out beyond that, I really didn't know what the sight picture looked like for that, and I would have trouble or I would struggle in that type of a picture or that type of a shot. Um, and I thought, well, I'd, you know, I want to become more consistent. At it. I'm not really looking at this from a standpoint of, of competition. I just want to be more consistent about being able to break birds and have more confidence that I'm going to be able to break them. So we went to the range and initially started out at, at about 35 yards and I was having just, you know, lots of trouble breaking the birds. Um, and then we said, okay, we're gonna sneak in and get a little bit closer to like about 25 yards. Was breaking them fairly consistently back to back up to 30, 30, 35 yards again and was having trouble. So Dave said, okay, try this. And he had my, me point my gun well offline, down low, back toward the trap. Not that we're doing a swing through technique because I'm, I'm not real, I mean, I'm not real comfortable with swing through, but basically just holding the gun well below offline and using an, a basically an intercept method 
So the bird would come up and you just literally, you know, you watch the bird, you lock onto it, you move the gun into the right position. Actually, in this case, at a somewhat upward angle and break the shot and darn it, that didn't work. And I was really surprised at that. I, I couldn't believe, I thought, you know, when he first told me, it's like, you know, point the gun over here and break the bird over there. I thought, there's no way this is going to work. Um, but it did, and it did over and over and over. And I just, I could not believe it. And, and really what this really, really gets down to is not so much about, um, about hold position or anything like that, but the idea is, is getting the gun so far off line that it's not coming up and jamming the bird. It's not getting in the line of the flight path of the bird, but you're relying on your subconscious to basically put the gun where the bird is going and intercept it or catch it, so to speak. Um, you know, it's the same idea that we've talked before about in the past of, you know, if you're throwing a football to somebody or whatever and they're running across the field, you don't have time to sit there and go, well, they're 40 yards out and based on that, I should probably give them a, you know, six foot of lead. So I'm going to, you know, look out, you know, figure that six foot of lead or whatever in there. You know, you, after you've done this numerous enough times, your, your mind just knows where to throw the ball in this case. And in this case here, in terms of shooting, it just knows where to move the gun. Um, so we did that at about 35 yards and then backed up to about 45 yards and struggled a little bit, but did this and struggled a little bit in that two things. One, I had no feel for how, you know, how, how far out in front or behind, or I should say how far out in front of the bird I should be placing the gun. Furthermore, I was using an IC uh, choke and a light mod, which is a, a kind of a little bit stretching the ability of that choke. I mean, yes, you can break birds at that distance, but you're kind of looking at a, at a lucky, you know, lucky couple pellets that need to be there. Um, so I actually did eventually after moving the lead out and then pulling it back and, and the approach I took is if I'm missing, I push out and I push out and push out. And if I'm still missing out there, then I'm going to start bringing it back and eventually actually bringing it back. Um, I was able to start breaking the bird. So then we really pushed it and went out to about 55 yards. And, and I can tell you, I've never shot at anything or broken at anything in terms of a fast 55 yard, actually anything 55 yard crosser before. Started out with my gun, um, which is a Beretta 682, and again, um, using sort of an intercept method of just holding the gun offline, bringing it up, and just moving it into the line of the bird. Uh, couldn't couldn't hit it. And then Dave said, well, here, try my gun, and he's he had a improved mod and a full choke in his. Um, and after a couple shots of, again, trying to find where the lead should be, was able to move it back because um, I went way out and then said, okay, that's too far and started coming back in when I wasn't hitting anything and darn if I didn't start hitting them. Um, I only did it a couple times because I was running out of ammo at that point, but I was really surprised um, of just, you know, how well that worked. So I think that's one of the things also to keep in mind is that when you're, when you're struggling with a, a long shot or something that you're doing like, like that, in terms of choke selection, you know, yes, you can put a mod choke in and hit things at 55 yards or 60 yards or whatever. But the the pattern has so many holes in it that, you know, the situation is I think what I was experiencing is that I may have been I may have been on the right distance in terms of lead, but because of the fact that I had so many holes in the pattern, I wasn't able to actually, you know, get enough shot density out there to break anything. Um, so you don't really know if you are or are not, um, you know, in the right distance there. So I think choke selection in a situation like that um, is or can be important. But when it comes to solving shooting slump conditions like this, it's not so much a, a question of, you know, where you are. It's more of a question of why you're not hitting the birds. You know, you, you know that you're not, you don't have enough lead or you have too much lead or whatever. But the question really comes down to, you know, why is this happening? And that's what you need to look at. In my case, the reason of why I believe why it's happening is that the longer I have time to, to run with the bird or try to stabilize the bird, um, the more my mind in this situation here starts becoming or trying to become actively engaged in, in the process of, of coming up with a system of breaking the bird. And, and this all reverts back, back to basically, I think, measuring, not consciously coming back and looking at the barrels to measure, but I have a keen awareness of the position of the gun relative to the bird. And because of that, I, I, I think what I actually end up doing is I end up slowing the gun down um, because I'm, I'm so kind of attuned to the position there that because of that, I'm not really then paying attention, or at least my body's not paying attention in terms of, um, of keeping the gun moving. And if it's not moving, 
fast enough in front of that bird, then it's gonna slow down and then you end up missing behind. A couple real point or quick points here, if I can find them uh, in Gill's book when he talks about um, shooting slumps. He says, to help with the diagnosis, um, he's included four questions that you can point yourself in a solid direction. And the four questions are, are you satisfied with the skill level you have been uh, when you're shooting well. Um, I, t personally speaking, I'm never satisfied with the, with the shooting level that I'm ever at. I mean, I'm always, you know, this is a situation where I'm always pushing myself to become better. And I think that's kind of true with everybody. I don't think anybody ever wants to say, well, that's just good enough. Um, but in my case, I'm always trying to improve my ability no matter what it is that I'm trying to do. And, and usually improve my ability means becoming more consistent of being able to break things. You know, yes, you break things, but then you don't. Um, and I want to be real consistent on, on what I'm doing because it's just more fun to be out there doing that and breaking things and to, to not break them when it comes to, to bird shooting. So um, he says here basically that what this usually gets down to, um, if, you're, if you're not satisfied with your skill level, is usually it re calls for going back to the fundamentals or back to basics. Um, in terms of getting a good gun mount, um, getting the right pre-shot routine, and so on and so forth. So, uh, the other question he says: Do makes do some mistakes occur randomly, or do they increase increase in pressure situations? Um, in this case here, I guess the only pressure situation you would really define, and what he's really talking about here is usually in terms of competition. You know, you go out and you practice and you do really well, but then you go into a competition and you just completely fall apart. Um, and that usually has not been my case. In fact, in competition, I usually do better than I do in practice. And I think primarily the reason is because I'm paying more attention to the birds and having a more defined um, break point of, and committing to it. Um, but that's what I think what he's getting down here. Usually this ends up being a mental issue where you succumb to pressure uh, when it comes to shooting. Uh, next thing, do you find yourself having a lot of negative thoughts or feelings during a shoot? Um, this again comes down to a, a mental side of things. Um, when you get into this rut of, of, you know, you walk into a station and you see something, you go, oh man, I cannot hit those things. I never can hit those things. You know, I don't know what to do. Then fear sets in, um, self doubt sets in. And when that happens, the chances of you hitting the birds really go out the window. Um, so, you know, that's one of the things there is that, again, if you have confidence um, and consistency in what you're doing, these questions won't come into your mind. But when you don't have that knowledge bank of, of how to break these birds or, or run, run certain situations, then the negative thought process goes through. Um, and I think probably the best way to deal with that is not become so attached to the, and this is good, this is really tough, but not become so attached to the, to to the score or breaking the bird, but you look at it as a learning situation. So, you know, if, if you miss it or whatever, make a change and see what works. Um, you know, yes, your score may suffer as a result of this, but if you keep doing the same thing over and over and over, getting frustrated, you're not really accomplishing anything at all. So look at it as a learning situation that if, if you know you have trouble with these things, go, okay, you know, I'm gonna look and see what I'm seeing. I'm gonna try to make the right move. I'm gonna try to, you know, get the right setup point, hold point, break point, and so on. And, and see how that works. And if it doesn't, make a change and see what does work. Um, so, so try to take a negative and turn it into a positive, at least when it comes to, to shooting a, a troubled uh, pair or station of birds. And the last point here is the problem affecting one or more aspects of your performance. Um, again, talking here about um, you know the mental side of things, when you get frustrated and everything, that you usually lose or drop your pre-shot routine um, because you'll feel either you'll feel rushed or just stressed that that the, the I shouldn't say the mechanics but the, the routines that you normally go through all of a sudden get replaced with fear. So what this will get down to is you know having your look point, your hold point, your break point. Um, one thing that I found that has really worked out well here, at least in trying to to bring my shooting back to where it was, is having a defined break point and committing to it. Um, I found that when I just kind of let the shot develop, so to speak, or, or build itself in the air, of not really knowing where I'd break it, but breaking it only when it when it looked right, um, I was inconsistent. But when I at least say, I'm gonna break the bird here when it's doing this or whatever it is in its flight path, um, and committing to that break point, uh, and just you know mounting the gun into it and, and breaking it seemed to work much better. 
So really for me, what this is getting down to is going back to um, trusting my instincts, having a, um, trying to get some, a matter of timing, um, trying to, you know, rediscover what should be the right hold point um, for a particular bird. Uh, one thing I've, I've kind of discovered in terms of my own shooting is that if I have a Sean, I, if I have a Shondell or something, um, where the target is initially going up and then what I'm shooting is going down. For some weird reason, my mind will latch on to the initial flight path trajectory, whatever it, of the bird when I first see it. So consequently, what will happen is I'll end up shooting over the bird. If it's going up and then going down, my mind latches onto the going up part so I can't seemingly get my gun down below the target line. What I found that helps in this situation here is holding the gun further out basically at the peak where it starts dropping and starting my vision there rather than starting it way back off the arm and watching it come up and go down I basically just pull my vision back to at the peak so all that I'm seeing is going down um, so there's little things like that that I'm, I'm beginning to kind of learn about my own my own shooting technique so I'm slowly bringing my my shooting slump back to uh, or, or hopefully getting rid of it here but it really kind of has turned into a um, interesting psychological and mental deep dive in my own techniques uh, unfortunately the whole entire engineer thing has um, has not been a benefit <laughs> in these in this case and it's very tough to just you know let go uh, let go of the control issues trust your instinct instinct trust your subconscious and, and let things happen um, but because of that I'm, I'm knowing that that will work out well for me I've also kind of changed some of my shooting techniques to to um, support that of, um, of where I hold a gun and, and so on and so forth. So at any rate, um, so one last thing here I wanted to do is we have not done a trivia question in some time. So, or at least I haven't. Um, so the trivia question for this week is who is, or I should say who, who won this year's uh, U.S. Open, the 2015 U.S. Open for sporting clays. And I'm not talking about golf, but I'm talking about the, the U.S. Open, 2015 U.S. Open for sporting clays. Uh, who won that? It's not particularly difficult to figure out the answer. Um, I tested this theory out to make sure that you could probably figure out who it was fairly easily. The information is out there in quite a few different locations. Um, I'm not going to give any hints, but one of them is a very big location and where you can find it. Um, so at any rate, get your answers in uh, a week from today. And the winner will get a copy of Gil Ash's book, uh, Guide to Sporting Clay's Consistency, you got to be out of your mind. Um, this literally for me, <laughs> using the title here, of I've got to be out of my mind. That's what I need to do is be out of my mind to shoot consistently. Um, that's the, the key thing in my case right now is just, you know, letting go and, and trying to shut my mind down. I've talked about maybe what I need to do is start heavily drinking so I can kill off a few brain cells. That may be, uh, <laughs> may be part of the solution, but I'm not quite willing to go there yet. So I think I've got a control on this. Um, it will be interesting here uh, in next weekend um, from when I'm filming this right now, which probably by the time you see this will probably already happen. I'm shooting the U.S. Western Open uh, up in um, Mount Vernon, Washington, and I've referred to this before, this, this location um, as basically Disneyland for shotgunners. This is the private range, which is open once a year. Uh, and I thought, you know what, I, what I've, I've always talked before, I would like to have the opportunity to go up there and shoot. And now that I'm a registered shooter, and I see a registered shooter, uh, I can go up and do that. So I'm shooting um, Saturday and Sunday. And the main point here, at least from my standpoint, is just go up there and have fun and, and not try to make anything happen. Um, it, I just, you know, try to stick with what I know uh, seemingly works and not get too frustrated about, um, you know, the negative that may come into it. Uh, because when you do that, again, you start running into a spiral and, and you start getting mad and upset and, and so, on, so on. So And we've talked before about that. So at any rate... It sounds, I don't know if you've heard in the background, but it sounds like we're getting some thunder here in the Seattle area, which means we're probably going to be seeing some rain here, which will be nice because um, the whole entire Pacific Northwest has been drying up like you can't believe. In fact, if you did watch the U.S. Open in terms of golf, you saw what that golf course looked like. Um, yes, that really was western Washington, and no, it does not look like a desert over here, but you wouldn't know that by, um, by watching that program when it was on. So, okay, enough of my babbling. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in.